we'll do that. Yeah. All right. But uh, uh, today is September 13th, uh, 2002. I'm at the home of uh, retired Colonel Tommy Thompson, who um, is a West Point graduate of the class of 1942. My name is Bob Babcock. I am with Americans Remembered Incorporated. And uh, we are starting uh, an interview to talk about uh, his official name is Albert N. Thompson, Colonel Retired, U.S. Army, serial number 024823. So, let's start off with some simple things. Where were you born? I was born in uh, Corona, Long Island, New York. And incidentally, uh, that's Archie Bunker's hometown in the TV series. I'll be darned. How's that for an auspicious beginning That's, in life? That is a great beginning in life. And uh, Archie had Archie was of your generation, too. Yeah, he sure was. Exactly. Uh, and when were you born? Uh, November 20, 1919. November 20, 1919. Um, and then growing up, you stayed there the most of your life growing up? I was raised mostly in a section of Brooklyn called Greenpoint. Okay. A tough neighborhood. Okay. How about your uh, your appointment to West Point? When did you decide you wanted to do that, and uh, how did you get into West Point? Well, my father was a soldier in World War One. Later became one of the charter members of a, an American Legion post. Mm -hmm. He was a first sergeant, and he had the greatest admiration for uh, West Point officers. And I think from the age of five, he had started talking to me about West Point, and it just became an obsession. I had to go to West Point. I was born to go to West Point. Great. Who, who appointed you to West Point? I was very fortunate. We came from a very poor family. My parents were immigrants, and uh, there was a congressman in our district who was a very fair man, and he gave me the, the, the uh, appointment on the basis of a competitive exam. Up until that time, congressmen had been giving appointments to uh, friends, relatives, uh, uh, sons of prominent citizens, etc., and even sold appointments. Hmm. In my district, uh, the appointment of the congressman's brother was sold to somebody in New Jersey. And the congressman, who at that time was a chief surgeon in a hospital there, was so... Uh, I read about the matter. He said, I'm going to run for Congress. I'm going to run on the basis of uh, civil service competitive examinations. So hmm. on that basis, I took the exam, and fortunately, I, I came out on top, and I got the appointment. Outstanding. So you entered West Point in uh, what year? July 1st, 1938. 1938, and uh, you went through uh, the plebe training. Uh, and I won't, we won't spend a lot of time in this interview talking about that, but talk to me about uh, December 7th, 1941, and how that changed West Point. Well, of course, December 7th was a big shock to all of us, uh, the shock being that we were at war. And when we heard of, I heard of Pearl Harbor, I said, where is Pearl Harbor? I had no idea. But immediately the, the school went on a war footing with a lot more security, you know, and uh, plans were made to, uh, to uh, immediately get more graduates. They accelerated the program at West Point. They started to graduate in three years. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our instructors were called to war, and we had no instructors. So what they did was take some of the brainier cadets in my class and made them instructors, and uh, quite a number of them taught uh, the plebe class in math, French, English. Mm -hmm. Did um, So you graduated in uh, June of 1942? Actually, May 29th. May 29th. We graduated a couple of days earlier. Uh, General George Marshall gave us our diplomas. Outstanding. And uh, then how long from the time that you graduated until you entered active duty? Well, uh, Normally, we used to, West Point is used to get about uh, a summer's leave time before they went to school. Uh, most of us had to report almost immediately. I'd say a week was the longest time anybody had. Wow. And then what was your first, uh, your first assignment? Uh, I started out initially in the, uh, in the Air Corps, but uh, 
didn't uh, didn't make that, so I went back to my base branch of the Coast Artillery. Coast Artillery, and then where were you assigned with the Coast Artillery? After I finished the Coast Artillery School at Fort Monroe in 1942, I was assigned to uh, the 5th Coast Artillery at Fort Wadsworth, defending the harbor defenses of New York. How about that? Did you did you live at home when you were doing this, or? Oh no, 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 no. Uh, we were on Staten Island, and many of my my boys came from Brooklyn. They could look across the harbor and, and see mm -hmm. Brooklyn. They wanted to go home, but the biggest leave or pass anybody could get in those days was only six hours. Mm -hmm. So that uh, it, it was a situation that was very bittersweet. You were near home, and yet you were not home. Right. Uh, how long did you do that? Well, I was there until uh, spring of 1944, and uh, the Coast Artillery did not appeal to me. Uh, it was defensively minded. Uh, they just didn't have that gung-ho-ism. I felt ashamed of myself that I was a professional officer, a West Point graduate, and here I am defending New York Harbor and uh, mm -hmm. the USO clubs of New York. I said, i got to get out of this. So uh, I appealed to the regimental commander. I wanted to go to the field artillery. Outstanding. So you went to the field artillery, and you ended up going to Fort Sill? Uh, yes, I did. Initially, I went to uh, Fort Chaffee, then Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, and uh, was assigned uh, to a unit, uh, sort of an attached officer to, to learn field artillery methods. And that summer, they sent me to Fort Sill. As a matter of fact, I was en route to Fort Sill when uh, D-Day occurred. I'll be darned. Uh, interesting sidelight, uh, Fort Ch uh, Camp Chaffee, Arkansas is about 40 miles from where I was born in 1943. Is that right? Where are you from? Uh, Hevener, Oklahoma. Is that Small right? Small town about 40 miles from Fort Chaffee, over by Fort Smith. I think there are great people out there. Oh, there are. I, I, I love being from there. Uh, talk about the field artillery weapons that you had uh, when you started. Well, uh, at that time, the field artillery was basically a, a light artillery organization. They had the uh, 105s and the, the 155s and the 155 long toms. They found out from experience in Europe that the, the long toms, which were probably our longest shooting weapon, did not have enough uh, explosive power, or brisance is the word in French, and we use it in English did not have enough explosive power to, to break open the German pillboxes and other fortifications. Something heavier, stronger was needed. And uh, it turned out that the 8-inch howitzer was that uh, weapon. The 8-inch howitzer was classified as heavy artillery, and it uh, was about 200 millimeters, and had a shell that was uh, 200 pounds, a range of 18,512 yards. The weapon was unique. We never had up until modern, till present times, a more accurate artillery weapon. And nobody really knows why it was so accurate, but at maximum range, it had a range probable error of only 12 yards. Wow. And laterally only three yards. It was like shooting ducks in a rain barrel. Mm. So it was... It was as good or better than the German 88 that you hear so much about, maybe. Yes, uh, we always knew about the 88. Uh, nothing spectacular about it except that it had a high muzzle velocity. It had what they called a Gerlich tube, where the, the barrel tapered out. It was wider at the breech end, and at the muzzle end it was narrower. Mm -hmm. And uh, that narrowness caused a more explosive effect as the round left the tube. We knew about that, but uh, that, uh, that principle wore out tubes. Mm -hmm. And I guess our army didn't want to go through that experience of yeah. dealing with worn out tubes all the time. Mm -hmm. the, uh, what unit was, after you finished your training, uh, what unit did you go to when you entered combat? I was in B battery of the, uh, second, of the 742nd Field Artillery Battalion. We were commanded by an outstanding Lieutenant Colonel uh, Walter Brinker, class of 39. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, now, now you say that was second, uh, B Battery, 742nd 
Field Artillery Battalion? That's correct. Okay. It was a separate battalion that was not in a division. And it was 8 inch? It was 8 inch. Okay. Uh, so tell me about some of your training memories about uh, what you went through in, in that period. Well, I can remember that uh, Saturday inspection was one of the traditions of the U.S. Army. I don't know if it still is, but it was a particularly hot Saturday in the, uh, in the summer of '44, uh, And uh, I was going up into the barracks, and for some reason, uh, the windows were shut. I don't know why, but it was stifling hot. And I had a sergeant from Brooklyn. And uh, he was a real character. He opened up the door, and we were hit with a blast of hot air. And immediately he shouted out, All right, you guys, open up them windows. Let's get some fresh H2O in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I had all to do to stifle myself and not uh, laugh out. But uh, we went ahead and made the inspection. But it just proved an old theorem, I guess, that uh, a little learning is a dangerous thing. <laughs> How about uh, yeah. other thoughts? Other thoughts? Uh, I remember it was, it was a tough training period. We were up early in the morning. We worked late at night. We, uh, we did a lot of what we call the RSOPs, reconnaissance, selection, occupation of position. We did a lot of firing. And I can remember that going out on the range every day, we would pass the German... Uh, prisoners. They were the Africa Corps types, big, bronzed, tough-looking men. Uh, I really admired their physiques, you know, and these guys were never conquered. They were surrendered and they, they came to America, but they worked there on the post and uh, they went to work every day with their shovels on their shoulders, marching along, singing uh, German marching songs, and uh, I... Uh, I used to say, gee, these guys are wearing shorts and short sleeves, and here we were with these heavy fatigues, you know, all covered up, hot, sweating. Mm -hmm. uh, a funny incident happened over there. A couple of them turned up with VD, and people wonder how they get VD. <laughs> well, it seems that they, they worked in the post laundry, and there were some cooperative females. <laughs> uh, as you... When was it that you finally got your orders to, to head for Europe to, to get involved in the war? We, uh, we went to, uh, to England at the, the very end of November of 44. And I sailed on the Britannic, the British luxury ship, which had been trimmed down to hold troops. We had the staff of the 66th Infantry Division, and uh, oddly enough, the Devardi of that division was on another convoy and was hit by German U-boats and that division lost all of its artillery and for that reason never really got into uh, divisional combat. Right, in fact... They went to Cherbourg and did, I guess did rear area duty and mop up. Right, and Cherbourg Harbor was where they lost so many people that were hit up, what was it, on uh, Christmas Eve, wasn't it, of 1944? Uh, with a torpedo attack? I, that I, I don't recall yeah. that particular incident. The Wall of the Missing in uh, American Cemetery has many, many 66 field artillery, or 66 division people. I didn't know they were field artillery. That's interesting. Yeah, they lost all of the body. I'll be darned. Uh, then you got to England, uh, you say, and how long a trip over was it? I think our trip took us uh, about seven days. And uh, it, was, it was miserable on that ship. Uh, the men were miserable. Uh, we officers had quarters, but uh, I just couldn't uh, take it upon myself to stay in the officers' quarters. I was down in the hold of the ship, and uh, the food was terrible. Our men complained. It was hot. And I tried to stay with them as much as I could to, to keep morale going and let them know if they're going to suffer, I'll suffer with them too. Mark of a true leader, right? Uh, you, how long were you in England after you, after you got there? We got to England about the first week of uh, December, and we stayed there till about mid-February. We were in the Midlands of England, just south of the Pottery area, Stoke-on-Trent, Hanley, and the air was always dark and uh, foggy. 
the sun didn't come out till 11 or 12 in the morning. You couldn't see anything. Hmm. And then it disappeared again about 2 in the afternoon. But it was a cold place. I was billeted in with a, uh, an English family. My room was so cold that I kept the windows open. I had a canteen of water that I carried over from the States, and that canteen of water remained frozen in my room. Wow, that is... That's how cold it was. <laughs> that is cold. That is cold. Uh, so then when it came time for you to move on over to, uh, to mainland Europe, uh, where did you go and uh, when was it? Well, it was about uh, mid-February when we left uh, England on an LST. I'd never seen an LST. God, I, it was a large ship because I had eight-inch houses on it and uh, mm -hmm. the eight inches just rolled into the ship. And uh, what luxury. I made my mind up after I saw the Navy that come the next war I was going to be a naval officer. <laughs> we had silver service and nice beds and bed sheets and everything. And don't you know, we had to wear ties when we went to the officer's mess. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. That's amazing. Did uh, let me? You say you had the your howitzers on there. Let me digress a minute. Were these towed or self-propelled? These were uh, towed howitzers. Towed howitzers. Okay. They, the howitzers weighed uh, fifteen tons, and we had seven and a half ton max, which pulled them. Okay. All right. So you landed at La Harve, uh, which is. Where is La Harve? I, I know where I'm, I, I'm drawing a blank. Well, it's uh, north north of Paris, a big seaport town. We landed on the beach there, and uh, again, it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon when we landed. It uh, was a cold day, and I said, let's, I said to somebody, when do we get out of here? And I was told by the people running the beach that uh, they had no idea that we'd have to stay there. And I said, stay where? They said, here on the beach. I said, you mean sleep on the beach here? They said, yes. Well, one thing I can't take is cold too much. And uh, I, I just couldn't uh, cotton to the thought of sleeping there overnight, shivering on that beach, at least overnight and possibly many others. Mm. I noticed that there were units moving out where the MPs had white brassards and they were directing traffic out. And I said, what, what's that there? What's going on? And they said, these are priority units and uh, they got to go out right away. I got a thought. I ran up to the battalion commander and I said, sir, do you want to get off this beach real fast? He said, we can't. I said, yes, sir, we can. He said, how? I said, let's all our officers put on handkerchiefs. <laughs> it looked like brassards. It was getting dark and we couldn't be identified as officers or uh, men or soldiers or MPs or what. So he said, good idea. We did that, and I led the battalion out with my battery going first, and I was yelling along the, the line, priority unit, everybody move out. <laughs> and we got off that beach in less than a half an hour's time. I said, now you were a battery commander, was, was that your job at the commander. time? I was a captain, yes. Okay, okay, let's go again. Okay, you got off the beach, and um, where did you go from there? Well, we went uh, overnight into one of these French cigarette camps. And uh, say more about cigarette camps. They named them Lucky Strike Lucky and things. Lucky Strike, Top Hat, and uh, all these these fancy names of uh, off-brand cigarettes. Okay. And uh, we spent the night there, and uh, the next day uh, we were on the way into uh, Rhineland and then Central Europe. Those were the two campaigns that we were in. Our uh, first position area was just outside the town of Zoltich. It was near Aachen. And uh, I, I, I'll never forget that night. Normally speaking, I could get a battery in a position in about 20 minutes. This time it took us six hours. Six hours. And it was so bad because the, the terrain, the earth was so soggy, wet, that the trucks did not have the traction to pull the heavy guns in the position. And we just went in inch by inch. And it was our tactic at the time not to fire from roads, but to get out into open fields and uh, conceal ourselves with camouflage. 
Well, I made my mind up that was the last time I was ever going to do that. From then on, I said to myself, regardless of what the orders are, common sense tells me, shoot from the roads. Don't get far off the roads in any event. Mm -hmm. uh, that first night, I had my first casualty. Somebody said to me, uh, we got a soldier injured. I said, what happened? And they mentioned to me the name of one soldier, whose name I will not repeat here. One of these types that was always talking and joking around, never listening and learning. And when the piece fired, it recoiled, hit him in the head and conked him out and they evacuated him. Mm. During, just before it got dark in the field in front of us, a light plane landed, one of these Cub planes, an L-4. An artillery observer jumped out, ran up to me and said, gasoline, give me gasoline, I need gasoline. I said, what's up? He said, I just spotted an enemy battery going in a position, I want to get him. I said, I don't have av gas. I said, I have mo gas only. He said, I don't care what you have, even if it's kerosene, give it to me, I want to get that battery. So we gave him the gas and he went up and I'm sure he gave the, uh, the Germans hell. Uh, boy, this, this young fellow, this observer, he sure typified that that esprit, you know, that, mm -hmm. that gung-hoism that uh, typified the American leadership. Right. Did they? Did your battery fire that mission, or did another battery fire oh, it? Oh, another battery another? fired it, yes, okay. yes, yes. He fired it with another battery. We fired, we fired through the night, and uh, I was in my CP when I got a call and said, one of our guns was hit. I said, oh, my God. I ran to the gun, and... Uh, I said, this looks like an airplane wing. And sure enough, it was an airplane wing. It was a wooden wing, one of the, the British mosquito bombers, which at that time the Brits had started to use uh, plywood to save metal. And it was returning from the mission where it had been hit, and it fell down. The wing fell on my gun. Fortunately, nobody was hit, no damage to the gun. I'll be there. That's amazing. How about some more experiences? Well, I can remember that we went through uh, a certain number of German towns, uh, names like uh, Mark Fredwitz, Stadt Meckenheim, and uh, Sinzig. On one occasion, it was a Sunday morning. No, it was not a Sunday morning. This was a, uh, it was an evening. It was getting dark. It had been raining. All our vehicles were mud splattered. Uh, all identification signs had disappeared, covered with mud. As it got dark, we came to an MP, and he gave me directions. I couldn't go ahead. I had to turn right and join a column, which I did. My radio operator said to me, hey, Captain, he said, that guy was a Kraut. Sure enough, it was a German MP directing the movement of a column which was in retreat. He said, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to get the hell out of here. <laughs> That's what. So, we got into the column, went down the road a couple of hundred yards. I said, the first good turn off, let's get in and get off to the right back, head for our own lines. And we did that. Uh, that night, uh, I didn't know where I was. So uh, we went into a German barn somewhere, went to sleep overnight. And the next morning, I found my battery again. <laughs> we, uh, we continued on to the town of Sinzig, which I'll never forget because uh, from there we fired at the famous bridge at Remagen. And I'm sure my battery had a lot to do along with the Air Force and everybody else who was pounded, but I think we were the heaviest artillery uh, unit in the area, and we just pounded the hell out of that bridge for days. And finally we were told, hey, stop. Uh, we want to save the bridge. We can get across it. So we stopped firing on that bridge. How far away were you from it when you were firing? What range were you firing? Uh, oh, I, I'd say maybe we were about five miles away from it. Okay. That would be my guess. It was uh, at that position that one night I started to inspect. I looked at my own feet and I said, my God, my feet look funny. And what I had was a starting case of trench foot. And I said to myself, if I've got it, my men must have it. So I went down and I immediately inspected all the gun crews, had the people take off their boots, and sure enough, a good many of them had about half the battery. So I immediately had them sit down uh, facing each other. 
one soldier would clasp the, the toes of his buddy with bare hands, his body heat to keep him warm. The other guy did the same. And that way we, we finally licked the problem. Great. We were in this position one afternoon and one gun was out of action because so many guys were that bad off. And the mission came down, battery 12 rounds. We never had a mission so large, battery 12 rounds. There was only uh, three, there were only three men on the gun and there I was by the gun and the chief of section said, what are we gonna do, Captain? I said, we're gonna fire. And uh, so I became a, a server of the peace. I and one of them grabbed the gun tray and carried these 200 pound projectiles. Normally four guys did it, two of us did it. We went back and forth, slogging through the mud, and while we rushed up on one occasion, the damn round slipped off the loading tray with a fuse on it and hit the earth. <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't have enough uh, zing to it to detonate. Mm -hmm. We wiped it off quickly with water and a rag and shoved it into the tube and let it go. But four of us manned that piece that normally would take about eight guys. And we did it. We got the eight rounds through. I never worked so hard in my life. And one time I was a young man, I was a longshoreman. <laughs> uh, we crossed the Rhine on a potting bridge. And that was a uh, notable event because I got over first to head out on a recon. But uh, my executive officer had a Jeep. Behind the Jeep, he had a German trailer. The German trailer wasn't wide enough to cover the tread, the roadway, of the Potten Bridge, and out in the middle of the stream, his trailer broke down and held up the whole U.S. Army. <laughs> you heard about that, I imagine. I did. I heard about it. He uh, he was given an Article 15 at that time, and uh, I said to him, "Why the hell did you do it? Why did you just dump the damn thing overboard?" He says, uh, sir, he says, everything I owned in the world was in that Jeep and uh, rather in the trailer. He said, it was either that or half a month's pay. He says, I let the pay go. <laughs> uh, where was this bridge? Was it close to the Remagen Bridge? Uh, no, we were downstream from the bridge. I would say roughly about five miles down. Okay. But boy, a lot of traffic poured across that bridge. They just, you can imagine uh, how it held up things when this guy broke down on Oh, I imagine. Place. I imagine. Uh, how about, uh, did you see any jet airplanes? Yes. Uh, just before we crossed uh, the Rhine, I saw jets for the first time in my life. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon, and I went to a slip trench to relieve myself. So here I'm sitting down, my trousers at my knees, and all of a sudden I see this thing come zooming down on us. I never saw a plane go that fast in my life. I swore it was out to get me. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am, pulling my pants up, trying to run away from it, and this thing is strafing. Uh, when it was all over, one of my sergeants came up and said, uh, Sir, we lost a man. One of our soldiers, Perry, a lineman, was up on a pole, and the plane got him. Mm. The sergeant said, uh, he said, wait a minute. He reached into his field jacket. He said, what the hell is this? And he pulled out. A fragment of a 20 millimeter shell. He had been hit but didn't know it, it didn't touch his flesh, but it ripped his jacket open. Oh, but I. So uh, that was on the only uh, casualty I had uh, as a result of the uh, enemy action. Mm -hmm. I never saw a plane go that fast, and I am definitely convinced today that. Uh, had the Germans had six more months' time, they could have prolonged that war by getting out more of these jet aircraft and possibly even have defeated us. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a very sobering thought. I watched our P-38s come up in pursuit, and it was a case of this with the jets and this with the P-38s. And P-38s were thought of to be very fast, yeah. right? Good hacking. Good right. hacking. Mm. We, uh, we continued on the other side of the Rhine up until uh, a town called Iserlohn. 
And um, I was given a position there. I was told there were about 40 battalions of artillery surrounding this town. All of a sudden, I saw a jeep with a German general. He was standing on it, holding the support bars and inspecting everything. And I said, my God, what the hell is this guy doing giving us a command inspection? What I found out was that uh, he'd been told, look, you're covered. You better surrender or else we're going to blow the hell out of you. And being the smart man that he was, he surrendered. <laughs> and uh, that, that ended the war up there in the, uh, in the rural pocket, so to speak. The first army, which I was a part of, was inactivated at the time. And uh, we changed all our markings, all our patches, and we came, became part of Patton's Third Army. And boy, that was a boost in the arm. Not that there was anything wrong with the First Army, I'm very proud of it, but here was the name of Patton, and we were going to be in his army. Mm -hmm. He had quite a mystique even then, didn't he? Oh, yes, he did. Uh, he, he sure had it. I mean, uh, the man was a real, a real fighting general. We, uh, we went from the First Army to the Third Army, as I say. I went out. A couple of days ahead of my battery, I was told to go down to South Germany, somewhere in the vicinity of Nuremberg, and they gave me a, a position area. They gave me a goose egg and said, find a gun position there. And I headed down. We went through Wetzlar, Germany, and uh, we got to the town of Aschaffensburg one evening. And uh, it was getting so dark, I had to go to sleep, so I saw some MPs, and I said, hey, I want to get a house. Where can I get a house? He said, oh, don't dare go in any house. He says, we're in some of them, Germans are in another. He says, you're taking a chance. He said, don't do it. So I pulled off the Autobahn, and uh, I had my own command car, and I had a wire truck with me, and uh, I had a survey vehicle. I normally had those three vehicles for recons, and we went to sleep off the side of the road that night. The next morning we awoke and found out that the Germans had left the town, they retreated, so we proceeded on our way down to Nuremberg. Nuremberg was a sight to see. This large city did not have a building standing in it. Mm. Everything was totally demolished. It was a, a, just one mass of rubble as far as the eye could see. Every road blocked with rubble except one was open, what they called the MSR, the main supply route. And the whole American army poured through Nuremberg, through this supply route, heading down into South Germany. We went into South Germany, and uh, it was May 1st when uh, there was a real phenomenon that happened. About two weeks earlier, we had to give up all of our winter clothing, the wool and stuff, and now we were in khakis. And it had been nice and warm, and sun shining every day. But on May 1st, a snowstorm came up. Hmm. There was more than six inches of snow on the ground. And we froze. God, it was a miserable night. And the battalion commander had received orders to just pull off the road and survive. That was the mission that night, survive. And we did. We pulled off the side of the road. I went to an old German barn with my battery, and there was well over 100 of us just huddled up there one human against the other, body heat providing body heat. I'll never forget that night. It was cold. <laughs> and then when the war ended, where were you when the war ended and when you got the word and what were your feelings and thoughts on that? Well, uh, from that, uh, from that uh, roadside position, <clears throat> we went down to a, an area called Mooseburg and assisted in the liberation of a PW camp. I found several of my classmates in there. Oh, we are. And uh, in addition to that, I found a boy who came from my hometown, my next door neighborhood. He had been an Air Force. Most of these people were Air Force types. Mm -hmm. We went down to Mooseburg, and there I occupied the uh, most irregular field artillery gun position the world's ever seen. In this eight-inch howitzer battery, I was a quarter mile out in front of the infantry troops who were behind me on the high ground. I complained bitterly. I told the battalion commander, this is a swamp. 
He says, it's the only place we can go. He says, the place is full of artillery. You've got to go there. So I put the guns into this swamp. We fired all night long. Fortunately, we were protected because in front of us, there was an elevated uh, section of terrain where the railroad went by. So that gave us good uh, flash and sight defilade. We fired all night long, and when morning came, we were told the war is over. What a relief. But then I looked at my guns, and all four guns, which had been firing all night long, were mired down up to the trunnions in the mud. <laughs> well, I had to get them out of there. So I went down the road, found a tank battalion, got two tanks, and they would hook the two tanks up in tandem and pull each gun out one by one like that. It looked like elephants in a circus, you know, going through the parade right. in town yep. just before they go into their tents. <laughs> that, that was the end of the war for me. What was the, uh, was there celebration? What did your troops do? Well, I told the troops, get clean. Let's get haircuts and shave. Let's get washed up and let's get our equipment cleaned up. So they took us up, they put us in a position high on a hilltop, which was a convent. It was a nice area because uh, there was water there to clean the vehicles, clean everything else up. And uh, we stayed there for about two days. And when we left, I was surprised one of my sergeants came up and says, the mother superior is here and wants to see you, Captain. I said, what does she want to see me for? He said, I don't know, but I had an interpreter, and he told me she was most thankful that my men did not rape, violate the nuns or, or loot the, uh, the convent. Hmm. And I told her, it's, it's not the practice of the American army. And his sister, I said, we just don't do these things. Mm -hmm. But I felt good about that, you know? Absolutely. You should have. So then what did you do as, you, as the war it was over, and what was your next step? Well, when the war was over, I was transferred to a series of units because the American Army was redeploying. So you, le you left your artillery battery then? Uh, yes, I was assigned to another battery. Okay. I was assigned to a 105 battery, and I said, God, this is almost like being an infantry rifleman with these little things. <laughs> I can put them on my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I was assigned to a, a, an 8-inch howitzer battery. And one day uh, I got a call and said I was to report to a town called Ruth, somewhere near Nuremberg. I went up there into a castle. I walked down a hallway at the end. There was some lieutenant colonel sitting very augustly behind the desk. And as I got closer to him, it was my old battalion commander. Mm. And he said, I found out where you were. He said, we have a new field artillery group here. He said, we're trying to get all regular officers into it, and uh, he said, they're welcome to the unit, so we joined up again. Mm -hmm. Then what types of duties did you have in that unit? <clears throat> in that unit, <clears throat> we were concerned uh, with two things, uh, discharging German prisoners, and at the same time repatriating displaced persons, plus denazification. In our denazification, the theory was to uh, make friends of these people. Don't lord it over them. Let them know we came there to liberate them, that we were their friends, and it worked. We bombarded their kids with baseballs, footballs, soccer balls, games, and candy and cokes. Uh, the soldiers love to play with kids. All soldiers do, I guess. Right. And uh, they were coaching the kids, and the kids took to it. and. I guess when these kids came home at night to talk to their parents, they said, these guys are not too bad. <laughs> Did you, uh, how was the food situation as far as the, as the German people? Were we supplying them with that as well? Uh, <clears throat> at the high level, I don't know what decisions were made, but locally I know that uh, many truck battalions were inactivated. They were painted black, and the Germans were given our uniforms, which were dyed black, and they formed what they called the Bavarian Trucking Corporation. And these Bavarian truckers went out to the fields and brought in the cabbage and the rutabagas and 
all the other stuff that they had not been able to harvest. In one town of Eichstätt that I re recollect, uh, the streets were full of cabbage up to two stories high. Well, wow. Vehicles couldn't get through. Hmm. Hmm. So then how long did you uh, stay over in Germany after, uh, after the war, and what, el what else did you do? Uh, I stayed over there for a while. Uh, I was the S2 of a group, and I had uh, a big prisoner camp of 2,000 prisoners, plus all the German bigwigs, Goering, Keitel, Yodel, Guderian, all of them. I had a PW cage of 92 German generals. Once a week I would receive a telex from Frankfurt, from Eisenhower's headquarters, with a series of questions that I had to ask these generals. And uh, oh, most of them spoke good English. And I can remember coming down the road, it'd be a quarter mile away from the, from the enclosure. I could see them hanging on the wires, waiting to see me. We became friends. Mm -hmm. and I said, a mere little captain, but they wanted somebody to talk to, and uh, they were very free and generous with their explanations. Nobody climbed up. They, they told us anything we wanted to know. Mm -hmm. But these, let, let's, let's pursue that a little bit more. The, these generals, 92 of them, some of them were guilty of war crimes, right? Uh, at that time, the thought of war crimes had not occurred to us. Right. And uh, possibly, possibly true. But uh, I can. Uh, I remember one question I had to ask one of the Germans. As he commanded the 11th, what they called Gesprenzte Division, which meant monster division. They had a big uh, dragon patch. And the question was, what were your defensive uh, plans on such and such a time and date in such and such an area? And this general said, we had none. I said, General, don't tell me that. I said, you're a soldier, I'm a soldier and you always have defensive plans. I mean, even if you're on an offensive mission, you never know when you have to go on a defense and you make plans. He said, but we didn't. I said, you had to. He said, the Fuhrer forbade it. And I said, you don't have to tell him, you do it. <laughs> and he said, oh no. He said, we had these political advisors in with us. And if we didn't obey, he said, kaput. Hmm. So, um, Interesting, differing yes. philosophy. Yes, yes, it was. I noticed that in the camp, too, with all these generals, there was one guy they deferred to. He was a colonel, but he was a colonel of the German of the German General Staff Corps. And he was he was the brain of the camp. Mm -hmm. How were they treated differently on a day-to-day -day basis versus a prisoner camp with regular enlisted men? Well, uh, the, these, these men, of course, did not have to work, and uh, they just uh, lolled around, they just relaxed, I guess they read, uh, they didn't want to escape, they wanted mm. to get home, Right. As, as did the enlisted men, and that, that was the big push to discharge this Wehrmacht, get these men home to their families, and uh, they were no threat to anybody, mm -hmm. so we did that, and... Uh, by the thousands, we discharged them every day and let them go back home. Uh, how did they, what did they leave with? Did, you didn't just turn them loose, did you? Did you give them a certain amount of rations or yes, they were, transportation? Yes, they, 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 they were fed. They were, they were, most of them uh, could go on the trains which the German government ran and nobody had to have a ticket. It was just a question if the train was there, you boarded, you found out where it was going, you went on the train and the train took off. Mm-hmm. And, and did they leave the American custody with a certain amount of food and clothing? Uh, yes, they were given. Uh, they, we made sure that they were, they were healthy. Uh, obviously, you've got to take care of the prisoners and the local population because uh, they need to have the public utilities, which we need. Uh, they need to have the food. They need to have the medical care. If, if they get an illness, it's soon going to become epidemic. Right. We, we worry about things like that. Mm-hmm. So it became a total different job once the war was over of handling the masses. Yes, yes. Did the German soldiers, were they taken out of uniform when they were discharged? Or? No, no, they were allowed, they stayed in uniform. They had no weapons, of course. Right. And each one knew where he was going and he wanted to head home, you know. Mm-hmm. And they were allowed to pass and by then the, I'm sure the animosity was still there, but the rules were such oh, that they, you left they, them. Uh, Animosity disappeared from 
as far as I was concerned. And as I looked at them, I could just see these guys wanted to go home. Right. Very interesting. Uh, so, how about you went you, you, you went to Graffenbeer? What was what was that mission? <clears throat> well, that was interesting. Uh, today, the American Army knows Graffenbeer because it's our big training post in Germany. At that time, it had been totally destroyed. We went up with our artillery group, and we were told, form a military post here just as you have it in the States. You are the quartermaster. You are the engineer. You are the provost marshal. You are the finance officer. Uh, you're the commissary officer. And I was uh, selected to be the adjutant of the post. And I can remember that uh, the executive officer said to me, the post commander wants to know if you want to be the adjutant. And I said, no way, sir. I said, I'm a soldier. And he said, that's what he thought he would say, but the answer is, you are the adjutant. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I learned the paperwork game real quickly. Right. And uh, at that time, there was no training. We just uh, rehabilitated the post. Our post engineer, field artilleryman, as we all were, he uh, got the German engineer, the civilian engineer who had been the post engineer, and they put in new roads and rehabbed the buildings, and we made it a fine post again. Mm -hmm. Did um, and that is the Graffen Beer as it is known today. I guess it's expanded considerably, but yes, uh, of course the size of the post uh, didn't. Very, it's the same size today because out surrounding it on the ring, there are German towns, and you don't want to fire into those towns. But uh, it's our big training area in Germany mm -hmm. today, and it has been ever since that time. Right. When was this? How long did you stay in Germany before you went back to the U.S.? I stayed in Germany till uh, September 1947. Mm. While I was uh, at Grafenberg, somebody told me there was a German gun you ought to see. And I said, where is it? North of the post in a town called Tischenreuth. So I drove up one day to Tischenreuth, and there I saw the biggest cannon the world's ever seen. It was the German siege gun used at Sebastopol. It, uh, it was carried on about three flat cars. It, uh, it had a muzzle end of uh, one meter. Wow. And the breech end, the breech end, I was able to stand in that, and I'm six foot one and a half. I stood in the breech end of this gun. Hmm. What, what was the range of that? This gun could fire 25 miles, I think, and uh, it fired a projectile of a, of a meter ton. Mm -hmm. They used it uh, several times, several rounds fired at Sebastopol, but the Germans found out it was ineffective because it had so much whip, so much dispersion at the far end that the, it never really knew where the ground was going to land, and they decided to stop using it. It would be better just to use aircraft. Mm -hmm. That was that was quite a thing. Years later, I went back to Germany in 1958, and again at Grafen, where I went to see this gun and found out that some military government officer in his personal wisdom decided it should be uh, scrapped and cut to pieces as metal. What a museum piece that would have been for the world to see. Well, wasn't it, though? Yeah, that was a big boner on his part. Mm -hmm. So you finally came home in, uh, so you were you were there from uh, February 45 until September of 47. Uh, then you came home, and how was it coming back to the U.S.? Well, by that time, the U.S. was uh, on a, uh, a path of uh, normalcy, I would say. I was assigned as a National Guard instructor in, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I was a senior instructor as a captain, normally called for colonel, for a corps artillery unit. Professionally, it was the most uh, rewarding position I have ever had in my career, because I had to learn about field artillery from the top on down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a good chance to, to see how things worked. And uh, the units that I trained there were among the first called to go into Korea because they were combat ready. That had to make you feel good. I felt good about that. Exactly.
So let's uh, let's stop just a second before we sort of wrap this thing up. But you finished off uh, what a thirty year? How long were you in the army? I stayed in actually twenty five years. Twenty five. Uh, when the, the war in Vietnam came, I was very disillusioned by it. I, I thought it was a very immoral war. I thought it was wrong to send our soldiers into it. And I just couldn't stomach it. I figured I had had enough. Mm -hmm. And by that time, the Army had become so lax, lack of discipline. And you were hearing about officers being fragged and things like that. And uh, it was tough for me to survive in an Army like that. So, so it was 67 was when you retired? February, the last day of February, 1967. Yeah, I was in Vietnam at that time. I went over in 66 and came home in 67. So uh, I, I understand your position. Where were you? How about the Korean War? What was your involvement in that? Well, uh, before we go into the Korean War, let's just mention one thing about uh, the lessons of World War II. Yes, sir. After the war, there were a series of boards which met infantry, armor, artillery, uh, chemical, signal on lessons of the war. Uh, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? What did the enemy do, etc.? So let's learn from this. These boards met, and uh, each board submitted its findings. And I remember it was about 1949, I think, when the reports finally came out. And I was most impressed by two things, the two great lessons of World War II. The first lesson was mission. The mission was paramount. It was our raison d'etre, the reason for living, the reason for being. And you had better fulfill the mission you were given. If you were sent out to do something, do it. Don't get wound up going somewhere else doing something that you shouldn't be doing. The mission was all important. Mm -hmm. And the second thing involved leadership. There are many kinds of leadership. There, there's leadership in a, in a school situation when you're in an administrative situation, when you're in a training situation, and, uh, of course, when you're in combat. And the big lesson is that while there are different styles of leadership that can be applied in these different situations, in combat, there's only one type of leadership that's acceptable, and that was hard, forceful, driving leadership. And it's no better exemplified than it was by General George Patton. You're right. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so we've talked about World War II and the lessons learned and your experiences up through 47 and, uh, and your great feeling of uh, satisfaction you got from working with training the National Guard. Uh, and in 1950, uh, the Korean War broke out. Uh, what'd that do to you? Well, it was in November 50. Uh, actually, on my birthday, November 20th, I had to leave my National Guard duties and uh, was sent over to, uh, to uh, Tokyo. I was pulled out of the pipeline. I was not sent to Korea initially. I was sent to uh, the G4 section where I became a logistics officer. How'd you get to Japan? Fly or boat? Oh no, at that time uh, everything was by boat. Yes, I went on and uh, then was an army transport. Okay. And uh, I guess maybe it took about 12 days as I recollect and uh, got to Japan and served in GHQ where, where the top boss was General MacArthur. Let me, let me dive change a second here. Japan in 1950, five years after the war, what's your impression of Japan as, a, as one of our enemies that we had defeated and it was five years forward? How had they progressed? MacArthur will go down in history in, in the years to come as not so much a great general as a great administrator of the peace. Uh, this man took that country out of practically a medieval situation, put him into the modern age uh, in every respect, mm -hmm. physically and in their thinking. It's just astounding. The most remarkable thing about it is that uh, in the history of occupations by other countries at other times in history, 
there have always been attacks against the occupying army. I don't think there is one recorded instance of an attack upon U.S. personnel in Japan. Mm. These people accepted us. They worked hard for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, they certainly cooperated with us. Great. Was the damage mostly taken care of by the time you got there in 1950? Yes, yes, yes. Tokyo was a, was a real going city at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember every day when MacArthur came to work and, and every day when he left work, the streets were lined from his headquarters back to the American embassy where he left with Japanese people, especially school kids, Japanese flags and American flags yelling, Mikasa, Mikasa. Abadar. Oh, yeah. They, they love the man. Yep. Okay, so you were G4 in Japan, and let's move forward from there. What did you do uh, from there on uh, at, during the well, Korean period? MacArthur was relieved, as you know. General Ridgway came in. Right. And one day I got a set of orders and said, uh, go to Korea. But these were orders that were a little different from anything else. It said in his orders, signed by General Ridgway personally, you are an accredited liaison officer to the United uh, Nations uh, Truce Delegation at Munsanli. We report to Admiral Joy for instructions. Hmm. So uh, I went there and joined the Truce team as the very junior man on the team. At that time, were you still a captain? I was or a major. Major? At that time. I was a major, yes. Okay. And uh, there, there was a great. Uh, assemblage of talent. There was a uh, commander of Far East Air Forces there, Admiral Joy, commander of the, the Navy in the Far East, General Hank Hodes, and uh, a man, a Navy type who was one of my heroes in World War II, Admiral 30 Knot Burke, Arlie Burke. Mm. So, it was really great to work with and among this group of people. Although, as I say, I, I was basically the gopher, you know, go for this, go for that. Right. And uh, I can remember that uh, every morning at 8 o'clock, I had to stop what was ever going on and give a time hack, synchronized watches. I, I'd say, General, I have to interrupt, please. It's almost time. In, uh, Ten seconds, it will be zero eight hundred hours local time, and I would count down. I'd say five, four, three, two, one. Time it is zero eight hundred hours local time. Admiral Joy fidgeted around for several days. One day, when I finished, he said to me, "Thompson, something is wrong with your timekeeping. Straighten it out, because I have to change every day." <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I got the last word in. The next day, the same routine followed. And I said, in 10 seconds, it will be 0800 hours local time. And as soon as I had finished saying it, I don't know whatever possessed me, but I suddenly said, this time is furnished courtesy of the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. The Admiral never said a word again. <laughs> I was getting my local time from Radio Tokyo. Mm -hmm. It really didn't matter where it came from. All that was important is that we were all together on the same time schedule. Right. <laughs> but that was really a funny incident. Uh, we had been there quite a while, talking back and forth. Nothing much was happening. When uh, General Ridgway decided that we should no longer meet up at Kaesong, which was in North Korea. He said, that's enemy territory. He said, uh, we should be meeting on neutral territory. And we had instructions to select a site. So our senior liaison officer, Je uh, Lieutenant Colonel Norm B. Edwards, and I, Horace Underwood, of the Underwood family, typewriter family, and a Chinese interpreter, we had an American who spoke very good Chinese. Four of us went forward to meet uh, representatives of the North Koreans and the Chinese at a little 
spot on the map where there were two mud huts. It was called Panmunja. Ah, we know. And that's the site that was selected. That's the one that all of us know about. Uh, say more. Keep following. Keep going with that. What happened after you you picked the site? And uh, tell me more about your uh, negotiations. The, uh, the negotiations were uh, were a rather frustrating affair. There was a, a language difficulty, and. Uh, the big thing that held us up, we could have had a, a peace, I guess, in uh, March of 1952. We could have had a peace at that time. Uh, the thing that held us up was the prisoners. What do you do about the prisoners? Initially, we said one for one. Then we said, well, uh, well, we'll give you back three for one of ours, ten for one, back and forth. And uh, there was great research done by our people. And, they went back into the Crusades and found out throughout the period of warfare that uh, when a truce was reached, when a war had ended, that everybody surrendered all for all. That was the general thing. So we said, okay, all for all, and they accepted. Mm -hmm. We reported back to the UN, which was the uh, was running the show. We were the executive agency for managing the war. And we found out that the, our UN ambassador, Eleanor Roosevelt, said no. No all for all. And she said the reason being that there must be some Americans that don't want to return. And we have no right to bring them back. Hmm. She was right. There were some who did not want to return. Right. These people were... Uh, war criminals of a sort, they collaborated, cooperated with the enemy or abused their fellow prisoners. And because she held us up so long, ultimately the war went on for well over a year and God knows how many American lives were lost because of Eleanor Roosevelt. Hmm. Were you still there when the final truce was, uh, was signed? No, no. My family came to Japan in uh, in March of uh, 52 and I was returned to Tokyo where I continued to serve as a logistics officer stayed there until uh, September 1953 okay and then came back to the states came back to the states what was your assignment back uh, from then on from then oh there I went to uh, the artillery school took the advanced course and uh, after taking the advanced course, uh, I was assigned uh, to West Point, 1954 to 57, as a as a French instructor. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your reflection on your 25 years as a soldier? Glad you did it. Glad I did it. I mean, I, I feel I was born to be a soldier. And when I die on my gravestone, I only want to see one word soldier. Uh, I understand that. How about, uh, what have you done since you retired? What, you had another career? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I saw an ad in the paper one day. It said, uh, would you like to make some money? And I said, I have nothing against that. <laughs> so I responded, had an interview with a wonderful man who turned out to be a general agent for a life insurance company. An outstanding person, William Thurman. One of the most moral, straightforward men the world's ever seen. I think he would have made a great general in the army because mm -hmm. he ran a good outfit. And uh, he kept telling us that the great thing in the life insurance industry was to get to be a member of the million dollar round table. Only 1% of all the life insurance agents throughout the world get into this organization. I'm proud to say that after my first year I made it, made it for six straight years and became a life member. Outstanding. Outstanding. When did you finally retire and start taking life easy? Well, I'm going on 83 now. I actually stopped about uh, at age 70. 
Okay. So I had I had 30 years in the insurance industry, 25 in the army. I only had two jobs in my lifetime. Fantastic. And, and right now, what do you do to keep yourself busy? Well, you can see here I have a house to take care of. Uh, I'm my own landscaper. Uh, I'm the man who has all the honeydew missions. Right. And then how involved are you with American Legion and other veterans organizations? Well, I am... Uh, I'm the senior vice commander of the uh, American Legion here in Atlanta. I'm the secretary treasurer of the National Association of uh, Uniformed Services of the state of Georgia. I sit on the uh, West Point uh, nomination board for Congressman Johnny Isaacson of the 6th Congressional District here in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get, from time to time, I get to talk to youth groups, especially in the high schools. I try to motivate them. I try to induce them to a career in the service. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, this has been a, an excellent job, and um, we may come back and talk some more and go into some more depth with another interview, but for first time, uh, this is it. And if, it ever is, if, if we do decide to do some more, we'll make sure that in the Library of Congress it is properly cataloged along with this tape. And uh, you've done a great service to uh, the American people and to yourself and your family. Thanks a lot, Tommy. That's right. Ken Moore, continuing to search those cars and continuing to keep this major, uh, major highway in Florida. In Calhoun, Georgia. You're going to hear part of that conversation. What? You must heard those guys talk. It's far. It hit him in the head and knocked him out and they evacuated him. During just before it got dark in the field in front of us, a light plane landed, one of these cub planes, and Elf was launched, and the artillery of the 